to a different place. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, first of all, big welcome to everybody uh, who is strong enough to stay and to participate in the uh, next open forum uh, on uh, uh, st stability and cooperation in cyberspace. I would invite very warmly everybody as well to sit uh, around the table uh, if uh, you wish so, because like that you will be able to uh, ask the questions more freely. So, without uh, further ado, uh, let me uh, open uh, up this uh, uh, forum uh, and the panel. I have uh, a really a great setup of speakers for you uh, today. We have uh, a, maybe starting with uh, Her Excellency Lata Reddy, uh, who is a co-chair of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace and the former Deputy National Security Advisor of India. She also served as a commissioner on the Global Commission on uh, Internet Governance, uh, the BUILD Commission, and has extensive experience in foreign policy and bilateral, regional, and multilateral negotiations. I have also uh, with me Mr. Wolfram von Heinitz, who is the head of cyber uh, policy coordination staff of the German Federal uh, Foreign uh, Office member as well of a German member of the group of governmental experts. Previously, uh, Wolfram uh, held different positions uh, such as research commissioner of the German Foreign Office and a member of its policy planning staff, specializing in cyber policy and cybersecurity, as well as he served in numerous diplomatic positions throughout the world. Next, we have uh, Situ Ponrac, who is currently serves as director of the International Cyber Policy Office at the Cyber Security Agency of Singapore. In this role, he drives uh, CSI's bilateral, regional, and international engagements. Prior to joining uh, CSA, uh, CITU has held positions in the Singapore uh, Parliament as well as the National Security Coordination Secretariat. Next, we have Deborah Brown, who is the Global Policy Advocacy Lead at the Association for Progressive Communications, APC. 
She leads APC's engagement in various UN processes, including, including in the UN General Assembly processes, developing norms around responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And last but not least, I have Matthew McDermott, uh, who is a Chief Business Development Officer in Access Partnership. You brought uh, to the uh, Access Partnership over 10 years of experience uh, working on global technology policy issues, and uh, you work on advising as well uh, across a range of sectors to help companies uh, and trade associations address regulatory barriers and execute government affairs strategies. So with that introduction, uh, I will, uh, like to, would like to ask Mrs. Maybe, uh, um, uh, Her Excellency Lata Reddy to uh, uh, give a short uh, uh, introduction. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I am, was particularly delighted at the subject of uh, uh, today's uh, forum, which is conflict prevention, cooperation, and stability in cyberspace. The reason is because our global commission, which has just published its report, of which I'm the co-chair, uh, has entitled its report itself, Advancing Cyber Stability because we feel without stability, there can be no peace, there can be no security. So we would rank that very high. We've reached the year of a 25-year-long period. We've reached the end of a 25-year-long period of relative strategic stability and relative peace among major powers. Uh, conflict has now taken new forms and cyber activities are now playing a leading role in the volatile environment. And the number of so and sophistication of cyber attacks have increased, thus threatening cyber stability. Simply put, people and organizations are no longer confident, they no longer have trust that they can use cyberspace safely. And they are not assured of the availability and integrity of services and the information that's being put out on this medium. Our global commission was convened against this background. And we began by identifying a cyber stability framework, which we felt encompassed the main areas. These, this framework included multi-stakeholder engagement, cyber stability principles, the development and implementation of voluntary norms, adherence to international law, confidence building measures, capacity building, and the open promulgation and widespread use of technical standards. After defining this framework, we then went into three elements which we define as principles First is multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, multi-stakeholder engagement is called for in many international agreements, yet it remains very contentious. Some continue to believe that ensuring international security and stability is exclusively the responsibility of states. In practice, however, the way cyberspace is designed, deployed, and operated is primarily by non-state uh, actors. And without their participation, we believe we cannot achieve security and stability. And non-state actors are often the first who would have to attribute, who would have to uh, announce or um, recognize that there's been a cyber attack, not a government. A government would then react to it. Uh, the commission therefore said that non-state actors have to be involved and what we said was everybody, state and non-state actors, and most of our principles, our norms, our recommendations address both parties, states and non-state. And we believed that we need to ensure four things. Responsibility, everyone is responsible. Restraint, no state or non-state actor should take actions that impair the stability of cyberspace. There's a requirement to act, not just to refrain from acting. We need to take the positive actions to, to basically ensure stability. And there must be respect for human rights. In cyberspace, 
online as there is offline. Building on these principles, we declared eight norms. I don't want to go into great detail on the norms, but I want to talk about three, which I think have found particular resonance in the international community. One is we should not damage the public core of the internet. By that, we mean the infrastructure on which the internet runs. Secondly, we must not allow the infrastructure relating to electoral processes to be disrupted. And here we make no distinction between democratic systems and non-democratic systems. Every electoral process has to be respected. And the third, I think, which has really resonated is basic cyber hygiene. You know, in other words, if we put the safeguards into place in cyber, in the cyber mechanisms, by the developers and producers, have a proper equity declaration process, vulnerabilities equity declaration process. I think, and we, most of all, if we execute the correct laws and regulations, and this is going to become increasingly important as we get into more disruptive technologies, the new challenges that are coming with 5G, with AI, with, with uh, automated uh, systems. I think that we may think cyber now permeates every area of your life, but believe me, this is going to be multiplied uh, literally thousands of times over. Those of us who are now connected to three or four devices will find ourselves connected to hundreds of devices in the future. And we're never as stronger than the weakest link. So making the system stable, making them safe, remains a very big responsibility. Uh, our commission has made some recommendations. We recognize we don't work in a vacuum. We recognize we're building on the work of others who went before us. I myself was in the Built Commission on Internet Governance. I worked in my government on framing the first cybersecurity policy. I worked in national uh, security. So I've seen things from inside government and outside government. And I genuinely believe in the multi-stakeholder model. I do not think governments have the capacity to do it on their own. Uh, the second thing which I would emphasize is we need to have those difficult conversations with those we perceive as adversaries. It's very easy to sit in very comfortable little cliques of like-minded people and could talk to each other. You're preaching to the converted. The trick is how are you going to convince people who don't come necessarily from the same method of thinking about very fundamental issues as you how do you convince them that this is in a common global interest to adopt certain uh, measures? We are engaging in different groups. We are engaging in the IGF. We will be engaging, and we have engaged already with the open-ended working group and the UNGG in the UN. I've just finished a meeting today with a group of parliamentarians who have gathered here in the IGF for the first time. And lawmakers, leaders, political leaders are realizing that this is something that has to be taken up at the highest level. Uh, my own prime minister in India has said that he does not have one single bilateral interaction with any leader where the question of cyber is not raised. Uh, I think that's indicative. I think we've created awareness. Now the question is how do we bring in stability? And, uh, you know, I've enjoyed all my interactions with every single group on this. So I'm hopeful. I believe we are all looking for the same thing. The question is, what is the right path to take to lead to it? How do we coordinate all the many efforts, the very sincere, well-meaning efforts that are going on around the world? And we hope that uh, through our little report, we have made some contribution to this, uh, to this effort. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I think that I really liked uh, uh, your approach uh, and what you described to a challenge of norm, norm building, how you do it, and also the fact that indeed, you know, there is responsibility for everybody, every part of the cyber, every actor of the cyberspace, be it from the public sector, uh, private sector, or civil society, has unique responsibilities and, and rights to do so. Wolfram, could I ask you to continue actually with uh, uh, with a government perspective? Oh, this one. Oh, I found technique. So, yeah, I would like to emphasize also the point that stability in cyberspace is a, I wouldn't call it, a, needs a framework, it needs a patchwork, basically. It is a patchwork. And we shouldn't focus to replace the patchwork through a unified model that won't work, but we should work on making the individual patches stronger and also strengthen the seams between the patches. So what are elements of stability in cyberspace? Well, first, first of all, you have, of course, the UN groups. We have, this year for the first time, we have two groups, an open-ended working group and a group of government experts working for stability in cyberspace. They do this on focusing, identifying threats to stability in cyberspace by working on how international law applies in cyberspace on norms, voluntary non-binding norms for responsible state behavior in cyberspace, on capacity building and on confidence building measures. Quite frankly, it's difficult to achieve progress in these groups at the moment as the geopolitical climate is not, doesn't stop in cyberspace. So the same confrontation we see in other area of politics, we also see in this area of politics. But still, I think some uh, success has been achieved in the recent years. Maybe there is more progress in the upcoming deliberations of these groups. We have to see. One of the biggest successes was already achieved a couple of years ago by one of the previous group of government experts. That is the agreement, the universal agreement that international law applies to cyberspace. So cyberspace is no place in Nirvana, somewhere in the nowhere. Cyberspace is, is a place on Earth. And the same international law, including human rights, including the UN Charter, applies in cyberspace like in the real world. So that already sets the framework. So we have already this framework. Then another group that complements the work of the UN groupings is actually the OSCE. The OSCE is a regional grouping, mainly focusing on European and North American countries, but basically it's the old East-West confrontation. And in these groups we discuss confident building measures to avoid conflict or if there is a conflict to, to limit it at least and prevent it from escalating. So I think that's another important framework. Then, as Lada already said, um, the uh, stability is only as stable as the weakest link in the chain, so we also have to focus on capacity building. The EU set up a new framework for capacity building, uh, greatly supported by Germany and Estonia and a couple of other countries, where we basically try to build up a network of experts that can help wherever a need is for increasing stability. There's also an international group called the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise that tries to coordinate international capacity building efforts. All this is not only, it's mainly state activities, but I think at least the countries in the European Union are unified in the strong belief that we can't do this alone. We need civil society actors, we need the private sectors. 95% of the resources of the internet are owned by private companies. The key factor of the internet is that it enables user to use user communication. So we have to enable the individual and companies who own the resources to play their part in stability. That's why the UN groups I talked about before, they started outreach processes. Unfortunately, the same country who uh, advocated the OAW, the Open Ended Working Group, then blocked the participation of a wider NGO community, but we're going to have next week in New York deliberations to get more voices into the process and to bring the process forward by, by that. Germany also took over the task of implementing recommendation five of the report, of the high-level panel report of the UN Secretary General, which basically deals with 
increasing global cooperation, digital cooperation, or basically linking the IGF, the very place where we are right now, uh, with other bodies and basically making it more relevant for decision making. So, and so we're also looking at from that angle how we can increase cooperation. Last but not least, all these norms and guidelines, and there are also, and I didn't talk about that because Reda did it also a lot of guidelines and principles involving the private sector. They are only as good as people, companies, individuals behave accordingly, and particularly states act accordingly to them. So what do we do if countries don't respect these rules? And really? So we're strong, another strong belief we have is that bad behavior in cyberspace must have consequences. Otherwise, we won't be able to create stability. So for that, within the EU, we created something which we colloquially refer to as a cyber diplomacy toolbox, which is a set of measures which we can use in case there is a serious cyber attack and we identify who is responsible for it, we can take a couple of measures, and the harshest of it would be, of course, cyber sanctions. Sanctions against individuals or entities who are responsible for that. And this is no, not a weak weapon, that's a very strong weapon, which we hope will have an impact that rules are respected in the first case, and if there is a violation of international rules and order, that the perpetrator basically returns back to good behavior, so it gives incentives to return to that. Of course, for EU countries, the principle is always that these um, measures have to be in accordance with international law and in respect of human rights. So this is a key principle we have in that. I think I stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Wolfram. I think that I take, uh, take out uh, a strong also plea for a need for accountability, that norms uh, in itself and, uh, you know, have to be as well as respected, but also about capacity building, that we need as well to equip everybody to be able to participate in the ongoing discussions. Situ, can I ask you to uh, take the floor next uh, and offer uh, your perspective? <clears throat> Thanks, Victor. I would like to offer a perspective from uh, where, where I come from. Singapore is part of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, and essentially when we look at the terms cyber stability, we look at cooperation, and we look at conflict prevention, the key way we look at all of this is that these are enablers. They enable economic progress for a region of 630 million people who live in countries which are very spread out in terms of capacity, which have diverse histories, diverse challenges, diverse uh, cultural uh, values. And when we have cyber stability it acts, and uh, cyber security, it acts as an enabler which allows people in this vast region and across the world to, to access economic progress, but not just economic progress, it also allows many people to access better living, job opportunities in the digital future. So this is how we look at the whole uh, idea of cyber stability and the need for cooperation. The digital future is something that is, a, is with us today and many countries are reaching into it. Uh, we, we like to use the imperfect analogy of, of a sports car with brakes. If you think about it, cyber stability or cyber security uh, is, is the, are the brakes, and uh, if the digital future is the sports car, if we want to go quickly, then there's a need to have good brakes. It's self-evident, and I think when we approach it from that, from that perspective also, Many of the things that my co-panelists have spoke before me, uh, international law applying to cyberspace, uh, CBMs, uh, confidence building measures, uh, capacity building, rules, norms and principles of state behavior in cyberspace then become important because they facilitate the stability and the trust that's needed to achieve this. So from our perspective, we, we have moved forward as a region and uh, this has to be done with political will, which is why we have discussions at the UN, but also in the region in the 2018 uh, in ASEAN. Under Singapore's chairmanship, uh, the ASEAN leaders issued a first statement, the first ever statement on cybersecurity cooperation, which actually brought together all these principles and 
strongly supported the idea of a rules-based cyberspace which will allow everyone, all stakeholders, to act with trust and confidence and reach, uh, reach the sort of potential that the digital future is holding for us. Just this year, uh, in, in the ASEAN Ministerial Conference on Cybersecurity that was uh, <coughs> uh, held in Singapore, the ministers of the ICT and cyber confirmed last year's decision to subscribe in principle to the 11 norms of state behavior recommended in the 2015 UNGG report, uh, making ASEAN the first and up to date the only regional grouping to do so in a document like that. And this year the ministers uh, have made a progress by, we, we made a chart, a norms chart where we put out all the 11 norms and then we picked out the ways in which we will need to build capacity uh, with inputs from all the ASEAN countries, and, and we have set up a working committee which will now develop a plan to build capacity. So allow me to finish by making three points. The, the three points that I would like to make in which countries and multi-stakeholders will need to work together, I think the idea is we have all the agreements on paper, very good agreements on paper. It is time for us now to identify the gaps. And uh, one of the things that Singapore as a small, highly networked state believes very strongly is there will always be disagreements. And uh, there will be 20%, perhaps 30% disagreements, but there's 70% that we agree on. And when we identify the gaps, we need to then work to, to build capacity. This is something that developing countries have, have, we, have been we, in conversation with us. That norms are not, or stability, the elements of cyber stability do not themselves implement themselves. But there is a need to build coordinated, uh, to have a co coordinated, robust effort at capacity building and addressing the gaps, awareness building. And this will mean identifying the resources, the partners, and also the metrics behind capacity building. I think something that Singapore is very keenly looking at, and we are working on this, is how do you know if capacity building is successful? Millions of dollars are being spent, and we need to find out so that we know ourselves if we have reached a goal. And this is where we find that, and one of the key uh, cornerstones of our capacity building efforts in Singapore, we have set up a $30 million center of excellence for capacity building for ASEAN. And one of our key fundamental uh, principles as we run programs is that none of the programs are run by government alone. We work with companies, we work with NGOs, we work with uh, uh, civil society groups to deliver training. And why? Because, as Lada put it so eloquently, government does not have all the answers. So I look forward to this conversation very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I really liked uh, uh, your uh, points on that we need to follow up on political engagements and uh, putting also assessing results how we uh, how we make that that's an important um, element and also that there is a space of building common denominators that we can agree on uh, even better deborah over to you for a civil society perspective thank you very much and thanks for the invitation I'm going to share a civil society perspective on some of the issues that we've discussed already and really appreciate the recognition from the previous speakers about the role of civil society. I'll start by explaining a little bit why we care about this issue. Um, cyber stability and security are important for a number of reasons, but we don't believe they're important for the sake of the internet itself. We believe they're important for the sake of people to improve their lives and exercise their human rights. So it's really important to come back to the people-centered approach to cybersecurity and stability. I'll speak a little bit about the role of civil society on some of the issues that were discussed already. So in terms of threats, civil society plays a role in monitoring threats and attacks. This is partly because we're often the target of cybersecurity threats, but we also have capacity, um, and when I talk about civil society, I also mean the broad umbrella of civil society, which can include the technical community and academia, which has been monitoring threats for a number of years now, and as the previous speaker mentioned, can often be the first actor to um, play a role in attribution. With regard to norms, civil society can play a role in monitoring compliance or lack of compliance with agreed voluntary norms. And um, in doing so, we can also play an advocacy role towards both governments and to the private sector to address threats and to comply with norms. We also play a role in raising awareness amongst 
uh, amongst society and, and civil society and citizens about the threats that they face in cyberspace and how to be more secure online. And also about the fact that there have been norms that have been um, agreed to, which I think isn't as commonly known in you know, normal um, places outside the IGF, outside internet governance spaces, which we tend to um, talk about these issues. And capacity building has been mentioned before as well, and civil society can play an important role in building capacity, as was mentioned by the previous speaker, um, in formal initiatives and also informally with people in society, with other stakeholders who are at risk of, of cyber, cyber attacks. In many ways, civil society, as I said, is broad. It includes, can include the academia and, the, and um, the technical community, but NGOs in particular, human rights organizations, play a, sp a specific role because, as I said, they're often either attacked themselves or we work very closely with human rights defenders, journalists, and people and communities who are marginalized or impacted by discrimination who are either targeted by uh, cybersecurity threats or when there's a general threat, a data breach or other type of cyber incident, have an acute experience because of their position of marginalization or vulnerability in society. In terms of, I want to pick up on a point the last speaker made about uh, we have a lot of good norms on paper and there's a need to implement them. And we think civil society plays an important role here. And at APC, we've been thinking about how do we um, have more robust measures to implement and to monitor implementation of norms? And one idea that we have actually comes from our experience in human rights spaces. At the UN Human Rights Council, there's a mechanism known as a universal periodic review. And it's been going on, it's in its third cycle now. And that allows states to report on their, um, their implementation of norms, and in that case also treaty obligations, but not in the case of cyber norms. That's not the parallel we'd make, but we think we can use this mechanism to allow states to self-report on their implementation of norms. And then there's also a role for civil society actors and national human rights institutions in the UPR to do shadow reporting and to contribute to that discussion. So what we're, uh, an idea we're developing is to see if a similar mechanism can be applied in the context of cyber norms and for states to be reporting on how they're implementing to allow also civil society, the technical community, private sector actors and, and others to also be part of that discussion and then to have that as a baseline to report against to see how progress is being made. Because we do feel there's quite a number of good norms that have been adopted in a voluntary nature. My colleague is actually part of the Global Commission and we really um, value the work that's been done there in advancing norms. So there's also a po possibility to have more norms adopted at the global level, but until there's an actual way to implement them and to monitor that, we feel that there's a lost opportunity and little progress will be made. Finally, I wanted to you know, appreciate the fact that we're having this conversation in the IGF, which is a multi-stakeholder forum, and it's, it's, it's valuable to have it here, but it's also a bit frustrating that we talk about multi-stakeholder approaches to cybersecurity at the IGF, and then when we go to New York, we find that the conversation is much more limited. And as was alluded to, um, I forget the number, maybe around 30 NGOs were had applied and went through a whole accreditation process that was formally set up by the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs only to be rejected. They weren't able to participate in the first substantive session in September of the open-ended working group in New York and um, the ECOSOC accredited NGOs were able to participate. So a few of us, APC one, was one of them was, but it's quite frustrating to talk about multi-stakeholder approaches in multi-stakeholder places and then go to the places where the actual discussions are happening and to be shut out of those discussions. And also to the importance of having those multi-stakeholder discussions at the national level. So I think the lesson from us is, you know, it's, it's good to have these discussions. It's a place where we can share and exchange ideas, but we also need to see a commitment in these other spaces to bring other stakeholders, stakeholders to the discussion because when it comes to the more kind of decision-making spaces, we're often shut out. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Deborah. I 
like the point about uh, you made about human centric a people centric approach that we very often indeed you know engage in the discussion about the state to state or big organization to big organization uh, discussions but uh, but we very often forget this is all about people at the end as well and your points about monitoring of compliance and the role of you know similar systems as UPR universal periodic review could maybe be applied in cyberspace Last but not least, Matthew, because we talked a lot about private sector. <laughs> so now, now it's your time to as well to give, uh, give perspective uh, from, uh, from that angle. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I'm going to bring a, a high level private sector perspective to this debate around norms and, and try and put it in, in, in that frame. And, and so, I mean, to start right at the beginning, uh, it, it is a truism that the internet is an amazing resource, an amazing tool that's allowed the seamless sharing of information around the world. And that is a platform on which a wide range of businesses have been able to address the needs of citizens and consumers. A key reason for that success is the stability of the platform, the stability of the internet. This certainty allows the private sector to make long-term decisions about investment, about hiring, about entering new markets, safe in the knowledge that the rules of the road of the internet will, will at best remain broadly the same and at least be interoperable. However, the rise in importance of the internet to day-to-day -day life for citizens around the world has made it a target for those who wish to cause harm. It has also led to discussions around sovereignty, not just in terms of non-intervention, but also as an obligation to protect what is within a country's own national space. One fix to this is to find norms of responsible behavior that generate trust within and between all members of the multi-stakeholder community. And the starting point for that is talking. Sessions like this one and the IGF in general are an important opportunity for the multi-stakeholder community to discuss these issues. I personally always enjoy learning at the IGF from perspectives that are geographically diverse and come from all communities. However, as has been mentioned before, currently much of the decision-making is at the multilateral level. While steps have been taken to broaden participation in some of these groupings, more is required to ensure that best practice is available to all communities. As to repeat again, a network is as strong as its weakest link. It is in all our interests that cybersecurity best practice is available to be discussed in those meetings and then able to be as widely disseminated as possible. Now, debate on these issues can quickly move to the realm of high politics and international law. While important, that should not detract from the mundane issues which are just as crucial. Certs should be set up and protected from attack. Countries should develop cybersecurity strategies, including the laws and regulations to ensure basic cyber hygiene. Mechanisms are required to allow dialogue between countries, including forums where the private sector can participate to discuss experiences and work on improving cybersecurity best practice. We need to recognize that transparency is a friend of cybersecurity. By sharing experiences, we can learn from each other. Only with continued focus on confidence building measures and capacity building can we continue to have comfort in the stability of the internet. Now, I don't want to pretend that all of this is straightforward. The complexity of the issues at stake and the range of national views make it hard to reach consensus. At the multilateral level, these discussions are shaped by complex negotiations on balancing freedom of expression with terrorist use of the internet, on the nature and legitimacy of cyber attack, and by the larger tension between national sovereignty and universal values. To address all of these will not be a quick process. But there are positives to take from this. It is good news that more countries are concerned about cybersecurity and are engaging in these discussions. This presents the challenge that in future discussions of norms will need to encompass a broader range of ideas. The starting point has been discussion on arms control and non-proliferation, but now the debate has evolved to accommodate new technologies and a broader group of international stakeholders. To close, I will come back to my point that business likes certainty. In this evolving space, business is keen to support the ongoing discovery process for norms that will support the stability of the internet. In doing so, we need to avoid outcomes that result in internet fragmentation and ensure that we have norms that can be effectively operationalized. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, my take, a point, take away point uh, for your presentation is if I can quote actually the report of the Global Commission, is that governments must focus on creating mechanisms that effectively incorporate participation of the private sector, technical community, academia, and other representatives of civil society. Uh, so 
without further ado, I would like sh actually to make the uh, panel as interactive as possible. So I would very much welcome any questions from the floor. Uh, and only in the case if there are no questions from the floor, I'll have my list of questions to panelists. So is there any brave person who wants to go and, and break the ice with the first question? Thank you very much, Victor, for organizing this panel. Uh, I heard it's also the first time the EAS is organizing something at the IGF, so I commend you for entering this space as well. Um, I had a question following uh, Deborah's suggestion of um, taking lessons from the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review Process. Um, I was wondering how, because we talk a lot about implementation of norms, um, if panel members have uh, any idea how exactly the self-reporting would work. Um, would we take specific norms? Would we take all of them? Um, and maybe to start to brainstorm a, a bit on which norms this would be possible for and which one we um, should maybe leave for a, a different um, process. Yeah, we had a kind of exercise was in the framework of the G7 countries, okay? It's a very limited framework. It's seven rich industrialized countries. Uh, but nevertheless, under the French presidency, we entered the space where the idea came up of having a peer review on how these seven countries implemented the norms. We then ended up basically with reporting how we did it so far. And it was a huge effort because it involves multiple uh, agencies of government and also other actors who all the agencies basically and actors who are involved in implementing norms. So we came up with a report. It's still in the hand of the French and the French ex-presidency of the G7 plans to publish basically it together. And I think if that comes out, that would be an example at least as how advanced countries implement the norms, it would put pressure on others, of course, to come up with a self-reporting about how they implemented the norms, and I think it should go forward for that. The individual country reports so far are not accessible, but I intend to raise this matter again and see what we can do. I thought also, and that's why we didn't publish ours so far, we think it's better if all seven come out at the same time or comprehensive form. But unfortunately, there's no French colleague here, but that is something to ask them how far the process is, and I don't know. So it's, it's not a universal periodic review, but it goes at least in the, in the direction because we're well aware that it is important to implement those norms. And also to give an example, not only to show off how, what we did and to point at failures, maybe, or recognize failures ourselves, also to give examples, because not always the non-implementation of norms, norms is done uh, with, because there's bad thinking behind that. Sometimes it's just the lack of capacities or the lack of knowledge on how to do it. Uh, sure, I can also add a bit of ex from our experience working with the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism. And I think we also have to be careful that it's a universal um, framework. So we're not comparing one country to another, but comparing each country to its own commitments. And the issue is we don't want to say there's no country that's perfect and some have much more resources and more developed programs around these issues. So we, it needs to be done in a way that shows where there's progress to be made, um, where there's need for more capacity building and where there's technical assistance needed so that it's not a matter of reporting and scoring countries to say that you know, the G7 countries, for example, have reached this level of implementation and other countries haven't. So I think it can be done in a way, I don't know that you would necessarily pick some norms to address first and others later, but to review them as a whole perhaps and to show where, where states are in terms of implementing, where there's a need for more technical assistance or capacity building. And then from that, I think the important part is to come up with a national implementation plan. And so I think that's maybe a way to approach it so that it doesn't become sort of a competition or a finger pointing exercise between states, but to show where each one is in their own um, course of implementation. So thanks, that's a great question. Um, so that's the question we asked ourselves actually when we subscribed in principle to the 11 norms. Uh, it wasn't a question of subscribing to some of them, but to subscribe to all of them. 
So, uh, and then it sounded good to subscribe and to have your leaders to say that we, we are supportive or we, we will implement these norms and to implement these norms. So the, the simple tool of a chart, uh, which I was alluding to earlier, we laid out the 11 norms one by one, and then we had a second column where we actually made, uh, had a workshop with the ASEAN members to say, well, these are areas in which we have already done some work. For example, mutual assistance, there's a, there's a mechanism where we can, certs can help each other. And then we had a third column uh, where we had capacity needed. And, and this is very poignant because uh, unlike the G7 uh, in the ASEAN region, there are countries, and I, and I resonate with something a co-panelist said about certs being protected from attacks, there, there are countries which have not yet fully developed their certs. So this is so important. And so it is a tracking tool, but at the same time, the middle column, which actually says, uh, there are things that we have already done, there's already mutual assistance, there's ways to work together, is also as important because the danger is that norms can seem to be so far away, especially if you're trying to build a national cert. So I think this is uh, how we have uh, done this within ASEAN so that we can track our progress and to share it with, with the international community. And certainly having uh, the G7 uh, uh, efforts will then, as uh, Ulfram says, become a, a, a sort of an example that we can look at and see what we can implement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Please. Thank you so much for this uh, very uh, interesting and ins inspiring panel. Um, my name is Jonas Graetz. I'm from the Swiss uh, Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. And I wanted to share with you and echo some of these points that, that were made, uh, um, uh, both from the business side and, and also from the Global Commission. Um, because we want to start next year, we also assess that it is important to have um, more buy-in from, 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 from the global industry into implementing, in implementing the norms. So what we want to do next year is to start our Geneva Dialogue, uh, where we want to have a really global um, exchange among, among different business players which are active in the field of uh, cyber security and uh, uh, for which cyber security is relevant, how they can contribute to implementing the existing norms and and how they see their role, because we think there is only a few actors currently active in this field, and uh, we want to build, first of all, capacity and raise awareness about those norms with additional players that are not yet part of the discussion, and then also come up with, uh, with a sort of a, um, best practices on implementing uh, the norms in, at the end of a multi-year, of course, process. That's what we, um, what we want to contribute. Um, and then also a question, I was participating this, this morning in another panel on uh, questioning the cyber making boundaries, cyber, cyber norm making boundaries or something like this was called. And there was a, some wariness because we had, a, we had both uh, uh, C-certs and certs in the room and, and then more policy people and there was a kind of a wariness in the room uh, 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 of, of the technical crowd, so to say. Uh, what are you doing at the policy level? And, and if once these norms get implemented, are they not interfering with our day-to-day -day work? Because they were fearing that uh, there would be sort of a growing awareness amongst governments that what they are doing is actually going against some of these norms. Or, and, and, and then so they said, we have trusted relationships uh, among ourselves. And now the governments would come in and kind of uh, 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 um, um, Stop these, uh, stop these uh, uh, collaborations which are already taking place on a technical level. So, how do you see this? Um, um, how do you see the? How can we improve the fit between the the norms, the norm makers, and and then how it is implemented on a technical level? I wouldn't say I see the split as harsh as it was uh, discussed this morning, but still we have to be aware of this. I think. Is there any, uh, anybody who wants to take uh, first the question? I, I, I think, you know, uh, I certainly have always seen this very uh, delicate balance between uh, the, the technology 
uh, innovators and those who are worried about regulation, right? And I think where certs are concerned, certs tend to feel that they are responsible for maintaining law and order. They are responsible for the lives of citizens also where there's a threat to life from a cyber attack. And uh, so certs would argue that they should, in a sense, have certain freedoms to act. It's not just certs. I would also include intelligence agencies. I would include uh, law, and, uh, law enforcement agencies in this grouping. Uh, I think it is a very delicate balance. I used to often say one of the hardest things about discussing cybersecurity in the government is the need to maintain that balance between privacy and, uh, and national security because you have to respect the rights of your citizens uh, in many countries, including mine, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that privacy is a fundamental right of the citizen. So when it comes to then having to take certain measures in the interest of national security to protect the life and property of citizens, are you then justified in invading that, uh, that privacy? So I think the question is, whether for certs, whether for any government agencies, there should be a very clearly laid down legal and administrative procedure to be followed. And provided that is rigidly implemented, followed, and people who deviate from that by using, uh, let's say, uh, not going through the proper procedure and simply engaging a, a, a company and saying do something that's illegal, should then be held to account. That's the real issue. The issue is not that they're not solutions. The issue is our governments prepared to take the hard steps to implement and make sure that people who don't follow correct procedures are punished. Thank you. Matthew and then Paul. Yeah. So, this morning, I told uh, a friend who's a member of the technical community that I was going to speak on this panel, and I, I couldn't shut him up. He spent five minutes telling me that we have norms, the technical community, it's all fine, why are you having this session? It's all under control. Um, <laughs> and I, I sit on the policy side of the house, I, I won't hide that. And I, and I told him that the, the world has changed, that the trust that the technical community has that enables uh, those relationships to function and, and the internet to work in that way is, is positive um, and it's been crucial to how it's run. But the, the, the debate has, the, the, the increase in the number of people involved in the debate requires light to be shined on that discussion as well, requires transparency there. But equally we can't move too quickly. We have a trusted a series of trusted relationships now, and you can't just tear those apart. I think through the, the norm building processes, uh, I mean, both, both at the UN level, at a national level, at a regional level, the, the, the core goal of those is to develop, um, to, to retain that trust and allow it to continue, so that as we move from uh, the, the current arrangement to, to a new way of working, that it is seamless, uh, that the internet remains safe, uh, and to come back to my point, that, that we retain the certainty under how the internet uh, operates and is governed. So, um, thank you. I, I thought I'll share a story in a response to your question. So, in our capacity building, we invite, since 2016, we have been inviting three groups of people from each government. One is the policy person, one is the incident response uh, person, and the third is the foreign affairs person. And, and what happened is that the first year we had a capacity building, we had a tabletop exercise, and we said all three of you will represent your country. And we, this is the scenario, there is a state-sponsored attack. Uh, now what do you do? It was amazing because the incident response person quickly jumped in and said, well, this is what I'll do, this is what I'll do. And the policy person looked mildly interested, the foreign policy person looked bored. <laughs> so, well, then we, you know, we stopped and we said, look, you know, this is a state-sponsored attack. We didn't, you know, it's just an, any anonymous state. And still, it, this is what happened. But what it showed us was the need to have such activity 
between the technical, the policy, and the foreign policy person because it is not evident even within government. So with the word multi-stakeholder, we also understand cybersecurity to be multidisciplinary. It is something, and I, and, I, and I live it every day because if you notice, I come from the cybersecurity agency of Singapore. So I need to explain to my colleagues who think it is very wonderful to go to Berlin in the winter uh, or in the cold weather, <laughs> that uh, why, why I'm relevant to their work. So I think that that is the nexus between that we have to create. And then we also have exercises in Singapore where we work, where we work with the uh, CII operators who are industry. And so I think this is where the dialogue happens, but it has to happen around real scenarios that we can understand each other because the technical people have a lot to teach us, the industry have a lot to teach us about our blind spots. Thank you. Okay, two points to make. First, to see to come back in February. You ain't seen nothing yet or anything. This is cold weather in Berlin. Uh, but having been recently in Singapore, I understand where you're coming from. Um, second, more important point on the question. I want to remind us of something I think Deborah said in the beginning. This is not about the internet, this is about the people. And I think this is the core element about it. So I gladly welcome dialogue with private sector, companies, etc. But we can't leave the rule making and the norm setting to private companies. We have to outbalance it at least by two other processes. One, we have to involve civil society representatives of actually the users, also sometimes the victims of, of, of policies and basically civil society as a whole. And secondly, most important, I think still that, that norm controls need a democratic control. And states, at least democratic, the organized states have a specific role in that because they normally, through their government bodies, represent the people, try to outbalance different conflicts of interest with themselves. I think this is an important element to, pu to put into that. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have the dialogue, and I spend, I would say, half of my time talking to civil society, but even more probably to, to companies because I think it is important. Luckily, I think we universally come more and more to an agreement about that. If I look back even a year or two years, there was a big drive in certain areas. Oh, we need our own Google principles or Amazon guidelines or whatever. And now sometimes, don't want to mention some companies, but some companies come to me and say, look, Wolfram, it's fine with our guidelines, but now we aren't into difficulties because we are confronted with different norms at, in each different state. If you look at self-driven cars, you know, you imagine the car has to stop at the border because there are different rules. Or look at the US where now individual states are setting norms for privacy control. So now they come, oh, what a great thing the GDPR is in Europe. You know, you have a unified area where you set in a complicated process, in a democratic process, in a process with participation of all kinds of actors. All could be improved, of course. So I'm not defending that as the ideal situation, but these companies say this is actually the environment we need. So it's even in the interest of companies to have basically others participating in the norm setting and particular role with democratic elected institutions. Thank you very much. I have a space for one more question. So are there any, uh, any volunteers for last question? If not, if there are none, I would like to maybe ask uh, each of you to have a, a snippet of a takeaway of concluding remarks uh, before we uh, wrap up. Your Excellency, you want to start? I actually, my biggest takeaway is something Matthew said. He said transparency is the friend of cybersecurity. I think that's a great slogan because most people think cybersecurity is best served by secrecy, hmm. by acting behind closed doors. I think the day you recognize that transparency is the friend of cybersecurity. And thank you very much for that, Matthew. That's my takeaway. Wolfram, do you want to? Uh... The snippet would be, it's complicated, but it's worth it. A slightly longer version of it would be, um, I really appreciate the focus in this discussion on implementation of norms. I think that is really uh, uh, 
promising avenue we should continue to go down. If you implement things, if they are successful at implementing norms, then the eagerness of building new norms and agreeing on new norms will also increase, I think. I think my key takeaway today is what Deborah said about the fact that humans are in the middle, are in the center, front and center of, of what we're doing. And I think, uh, as I was saying in our, in our way of looking at it, it's, it's all the people who need economic enablement, betterment of living standards and lives. And that, I think, sort of crystallizes the need for us to work together. It is a team sport. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll build on Matthew's um, takeaway or key point, which is that human rights are the friend of cybersecurity because we need strong cybersecurity to enable human rights. And it's through strong cybersecurity that um, we're able to do so. And so I think we often look at them as pitted against one another, but actually there's a right to security. There's a human right to security, and we can't keep looking at them at, at odds with each other because in the end we need both. Thanks. Matthew? People have taken my, my takeaway. I, I think I would channel my technical uh, community colleague and, and, and say, don't break what we have. Um, but then I'd follow that up by saying that what we have now is trust. And that as we examine these norms and look to develop new norms for the future, we can't forget that what we're trying to achieve is, is, is a place of trust. Thank you very much. My main takeaway will be that indeed multi-stakeholder approach is so enriching and that's why we need to not only preach it but also to implement that in practice and it was so such a great learning pressure, uh, pre uh, um, time for me uh, to uh, enjoy your presentations. We as the uh, European Union uh, of course uh, want to indeed walk the walk and talk the talk. Uh, so we are uh, uh, entrusted our friends uh, in the uh, uh, European Union's Institute for Strategic Studies uh, to, uh, to undertake engagement with uh, multi-stakeholder communities. And one of the very concrete sort of uh, uh, takeaways as well is that uh, we are going to uh, bring and sponsor uh, a quite a vast number of uh, civil society participants for the next uh, intersessional meeting of the Open and Working Group uh, in New York. So, Thank you very much to all of uh, my distinguished panelists. Thank you very much uh, to you uh, as the audience. And uh, hopefully, see you next year, uh, most likely in Poland, I guess, uh, at the next AGF. Thank you.